A few months ago I came across this brilliant project on Hackaday. It's a clock that uses a tuning fork to keep the time. Um, it's by Chris Slyker, who also has an accompanying video. Um, the first thing I want to say is go and subscribe to Chris's channel. They are criminally undersubscribed. Far better content than I can put out. And Chris is an actual electronics engineer, unlike me. I'm just a guy that likes playing with electronics. Um, so, yeah, Chris's clock uses an audio tuning fork to keep the time. Um, and they were able to design a circuit which essentially keeps the, the fork ringing. It, it, it functions on the same principle as a guitar pickup, but in reverse. So I copied the circuit, quite frankly. I am not smart enough to come up with something like that myself and put it into my own clock. So a little bit different to Chris's. So the first thing that's rather obvious is the, the tube display. So anyone that saw my last video will be familiar with, with, with my affinity for ex-Soviet displays. Um, and this is another one. This is a VFD or vacuum fluorescent display. So the process of actually hooking up this VFD display to the tuning fork circuit was honestly not that complicated. So I'm not sure how well this is going to show up on the camera, but VFD displays essentially consist of three layers. At the front, we can just about make out a couple of thin wires. So those are cathodes. So we apply five volts to the cathode and it heats up. Behind the cathode, is a grid, you can see these square grids, one for each digit, and behind the grids are the digits themselves, which are coated in a phosphor, which will glow if it's hit by electrons. So I've drawn that out here um, in an in a obviously simplified exploded view. So at the top here are the cathode wires, below which is the grid, and then the individual digits below. So if we apply five volts to the cathode, it heats up, and that causes it to release electrons. Now, to light up a digit, we'd want to attract the electrons to the digit. So we, we need it at a positive voltage. So in the case of these IV18 tubes, it's about 25 volts we need. So we have the cathode giving off electrons. We turn on a segment. Let's, let's just say this bottom segment here we want to light up. Um, so we apply 25 volts to that. Um, and. We, if the grid wasn't there, that would indeed light it up. Um, however, for a, a tube with, say, my, my, my tubes have eight digits, that require a huge number of connections. You'd need one for every individual segment. So what, what we do instead is we have a grid that activates the entire digit. So if the cathode's on, giving off electrons, and we turn on the grid, nothing lights yet, but then turning on an individual segment will light it. So the grid and a segment has to be turned on for that segment to, to light. Now, for all the different digits, the same segments are joined together. So if I, again, if the grid wasn't there and I applied 25 volts to this top line here, it would light the bottom left segment on each digit, which would be kind of useless because we could only light the same segment on every digit. So what we do is to light, say, number one on the left segment, we turn on the left grid and turn on these two segments here. Now, these two segments don't light on the right digit because its grid isn't activated. So to actually display multiple numbers, we multiplex exactly the same as with the, with the Nixie clock. And I've got some slowed down footage here to show how each digit is lit individually. So how do we control each of the digits and segments individually and in sequence to multiplex? Well, obviously we're going to need a microcontroller, um, but microcontrollers only do up to a maximum of five volts normally. Uh, we're operating at 25. So let's go through the circuit that I came up with to, to do this. We start off with um, a simple step up converter that takes us up to the 25 volts that we need for the anodes. I just bought one off eBay. I didn't design, design a circuit myself for that. That then feeds into um, a VFD controller. So that's this large chip on the back here. 
Um, I used one called an HV5812. Um, the reason I went for that is because they have a through-hole model available, so it was easier to test and assemble. So what the HV5812 does is, is essentially just a line-level interface. We give it data from the microcontroller through three outputs, and it, it converts that to 25 or 0 volt outputs that then feed into the tube itself. So the tubes here, again, it requires 5 volts for the, for the cathode, but then the outputs from the controller, and there are many more than shown here, they correspond to seven segment outputs and the eight digit outputs. So by supplying the correct string of bits from the microcontroller, we can sequentially tell it which digit to light up and which segments of those digits. Now, that would just control your um, a VFD if, if you were just wanting to make a nice normal clock. However, the microcontroller has another input here, and this is the square wave from the tuning fork circuit. So again, that's the circuit I copied from Chris. We feed that into the microcontroller, and that's what it uses as the time reference. So the Arduino code that I put together, and I did write it in Arduino, which is rather lazy of me, um, but the Arduino code that I put together, it just listens out for whenever there is a downward cliff, um, and then it, up, it updates the time. So, as I mentioned at the start, one of the more interesting problems with this clock was making it so that it just didn't cause a complete racket, because that tuning fork is louder than you think. Um, and the circuit really does, uh, does get it oscillating quite a lot as well. Um, so, I went through several different iterations of, of ideas for for mounts and bases and, and that kind of thing to, to stop, um, to help mitigate the vibrations. At one point I even 3D printed a, a suspended mount, the idea being it glued in and then it would be isolated from um, from the desk. Uh, it was actually really ineffective that. I think the, the elastic was just in too much tension and it just carried the vibrations. Um, pretty much the simplest solution was best in the end. So it's these 3D printed helical coil feet. Um, yeah, they're actually quite quite effective. Um, the main source of the vibration now, actually, is if I place it on the table, you, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, because I suspect it's going to be notch filtered out. But I will I will add it back in at this point of the video, if it is. Um, but the main source is, is the power cable. Um, if the power cable touches the desk, it's carrying, carrying enough vibration, um, and it gets quite noisy. So I just tend to put a little loop in it to, to help, help mitigate that. Um, Let's talk about a few other issues. Um, okay, so as I've mentioned already, I, I kind of threw this together. So issue number one, if I wave my hand near the back, the lights start flickering, the digits start flickering. Uh, there's obviously, there we go. There's obviously something going on with inductance. So it's some, somehow there. Um, I, I'm not smart enough to solve that. I don't really care that much. Um, if you just wave your hand around enough, it, it, it generally goes away. It's not going away now. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there for now. It's a fun demo. Um, <clears throat> you will notice up here in the top right corner, that was originally where the power came in because I tried to be smart and use a through-hole uh, micro USB, which was a terrible idea. Um, it, it didn't... I couldn't get it connected up properly. I botched the soldering. So in the end, I just added a, a power jack directly into the, into the step-up board there. Uh, the designs on GitHub just have that th they now have a um, surface mount micro USB here. Um, other issues, I know there's at least one other problem with this. Well, there's obviously the fact that if we lose power, the time resets. I didn't put any kind of backup in. Um, I just wanted it sat on my desk looking cool. I don't really care about how practical it is, to be honest. Um, oh, yeah, and the final one. So, again, the design on GitHub is corrected, but mine, of course, the back. Someone will have noticed, so I just have to come clean. Bodge wires. Um, I have awful spatial awareness. Anyone that knows me will, will be aware of that. So um, when I designed it, I was absolutely paranoid about the um, tube being back to front. So I checked and I rechecked, and then it arrived, and I soldered it in, and then I realised it was back to front. So luckily it wasn't that hard to correct, but yeah, indeed, I do have a bunch of bodge wires sorting that out here. Um, but as I said, the linked GitHub repository, that's, that's all been corrected for. 
Right, I'll leave it here. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask in the comments or just give me a shout on GitHub. And thanks very much for watching.